If I could just summarize what you just read, I would summarize it in five words, and that would just be, they just don't get it. I had to count that, make sure I wasn't lying to you. Um, the disciples at this point, it just seems like they just don't get it. And it would appear from the surface, not even from the, it would just appear like as you read through the life of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and how he has these disciples with him and how he's been teaching them and, and with them, uh, for, you know, all this time. And the thing that's striking to me is that Jesus is talking about pain and suffering and what he is literally about to endure and, and the disciples are more concerned with status and where they're going to sit. And their concern is not on the inevitable. And the inevitable is that Jesus Christ is about to endure suffering, death, the penalty of a criminal by the way of the cross. And in order for us to trace these go through these verses this morning. I want to I kind of just categorize this. What, what we see here is, is a description of where they are, and that's going to be important, and not just physically in their location, but also uh, where they are in a mental uh, state. We're also going to see not just that, but a prescript or a prediction that Jesus is going to give to them and I want us to look at their reaction, and then there's going to be uh, just a little bit of application. And if I were a Southern Baptist, I would have given you another fifth point with the shun on the back of it. Um, but that made me sound like I was a charismatic. And so let's just go through this. I want to look at some of these things. The description of their location and the disciples' attitude, and also Jesus' attitude. When you look at this, Jesus is saying, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. Now, in proximity to where they are in Israel, you always hear that. You always hear, even if you look through the Old Testament, let's go up to Jerusalem. In fact, you can get this from Psalm 122. It says, Jerusalem is built like a city. That is where all of the tribes go up to. In Isaiah 2, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord. In Psalm 24, it says, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord, that, that the kingdom of God only those with clean hands and a pure heart. That's what's taking place here. They are literally on the ascension towards Jerusalem. And Jesus, as Messiah and rabbi, has his pupils or his, his disciples with him. And they are making a very fat... Jesus has... He is not going to be distracted on the way. He has one thing in mind and one thing only in his mind. And that is the suffering that he is about to endure. And Christ, our Savior, is taking these disciples. And we get a little glimpse of the attitude of these disciples. If you just noticed, when we read right before Jesus gives his, I believe it's his third prediction of his death, that the disciples, it says that they were, some were astonished and some were afraid. You catch that? Some were astonished and others were afraid. And in their astonishment and in their fear, Jesus takes them into a little uh, detour mentally and tells them what is about to happen. He's got one thing in mind and one thing only, and that is to go up to, to where he will endure the suffering of the cross. And that's interesting, and we'll get into this a little bit, but I just want to make note of this, uh, just in passing, that, that when you see scriptures where it says that Jesus went up to, or, or, or he will be lifted up, what is he always talking about? He's going up to where he will endure the cross. This is where he would atone. Now, that's a big word. This is where he would take our place. This is where that he would, as the scripture just said, take the cup of the wrath of God on our place, in our place. And that wasn't in the garden where he would uh, painfully cry out to the Father. No, the atonement, the sacrifice of Christ. Anytime you see this, that he would go up or he would be lifted up is in any instance, this is him identifying, this is what's about to happen to me. I'm about to die. I'm about to suffer the penalty 
of sin and death. Now, it's no wonder that they have astonishment and fear. Now, I want you to look at this prediction that Jesus gives. Jesus takes his 12 aside, and, and this is, I believe, the third time Jesus is going to predict his uh, impending doom. And so they take from the description, we move to this prediction that Jesus gives. Look at it one more time in verse 33. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, who will spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And in three days, he will rise again. Now, what is Je Jesus is not just predicting what he knows is about to take place, but this is Jesus taking his cues from the Old Testament because it was the Old Testament that was giving us these many predictions about a soon coming Messiah that would come and would die. I'm thinking of Psalm 22, 7, which reads, All who see me, they mock me, they hurl their insults, shaking their head. I think of Isaiah 50, when it says, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out of my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. And then you think about the, 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 the more infamous uh, prediction of Christ's death in Isaiah 53. And, and these familiar words, he was despised. He was rejected by men and men of sorrows and familiar with suffering. And like one whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. He's talking about his death and our redemption. You got this prediction of Jesus' death. He's got one focus, one focus only. He's making the climb to the top of the city because he knows it is there where he will suffer on our behalf. And now, and now watch, watch these silly little disciples. You know, at some point, we'll stop hating on them, but they just give us too much good material. Some, something about these disciples, they're, it, it, what, 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 what makes me know that these were all men, Okay. These, these were men, these 12, right? One of them didn't name Judas and was a female. No, they were all dudes. And here's how I know they were dudes. Because like all men, they have the problem of selective hearing. Right, ladies? I mean, I thought I'd have another amen right there, but y'all left me hanging. This is, this is the problem that, that, has, that is not new. Your, your husband doesn't just wake up one day and just say, you know what, today I think we're going to have the problem with selective hearing. This has been a long problem for thousands of years. And we'll never evolve out of this problem. This is a sin problem that we, us, us guys, will always have. You didn't tell me that. That's what I tell my wife all the time. You didn't, you didn't tell me that. You didn't tell me this was going to happen. Why didn't you tell me about that? In fact, I told you we had, the, in fact, I sat right here, right beside you, and we had this conversation, and it went just like this, and she can narrate word for word. That woman's got a brain like no other. Word for word, tell me everything that she said, and I'm like, you didn't tell me. <laughs> and this was these disciples. You would think at this point that they would know, they would say to Jesus, yes, you've been telling us this. Yes, I hear you. Yes, yes, I believe what you're saying. What can we do? What, what, what are some things that we can do, Jesus? What can, what can, we, can we pray? Can we, can, we, can we just surround you? Can we just give you a big old, ba great big hug? Like what you would think that this would be, in fact, this is the right response that you should do for someone who is about to die. But, but, but if they were today, if, if they were walking around with Jesus and Jesus told them, I'm about to die, I'm about to suffer, I'm about to, the cup of the wrath of God is about to just pour out on me. You know what they do today? They'd go down to St. George and get into to, to the, the Barnes and Noble or whatever it's called. And, and they would go and they would find on, on the bestsellers, and, and you know what they'd find at the bestsellers? Well, well, Jesus, let, let me get you a book on how you can live your best life now with the picture of a dude with like really bright, shiny teeth. And, 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 and you would say to yourself, um, Jesus, this is what you need Be, because, because I don't want a Christianity that, that, that is calling something, calling me 
into something. And particularly, I don't want a Christianity that requires me to suffer. And these disciples would have made their trek down to the local library or the local bookstore and found the book, Live Your Best Life Now, and would have gave it to Jesus. That's exactly what they would have done. Because that's exactly what you and I would do if Jesus requires us to suffer for his name's sake. We want a gospel and we want a Christianity that says, no, I don't want the suffering. I don't want Jesus to to put his finger on the pain point of my life and requires me to lay down idols. No, I want the Jesus that gives me stuff. And I know this is exactly what they're doing. Okay, you're going to endure a painful bit there, Jesus, but I want my best life now. Let me tell you when that, let me tell you how that, that never works. It, it, it never works. The, the, the facade of your best life now. It is so counterintuitive to the gospel to think that Christ would want us to live our happy and best self now on earth. If this is your best life now, then you have no heaven to look forward to. Hell is what you have to look forward to. This past week, I'm, I'm thinking of, of my coworker who, who, who described to me that his friend in his neighborhood, a real good friend, hung himself so that his wife and four little children would find him. And he says, what do I do? What, what do I do? Well, David, you know what you ought to do? You ought to read your best life now. And, I, and, I, and I've walked through pain, and I've walked through my own trauma, and I've walked with you through some trauma. And you know what I'll never say? You know what you need? You need to know how to live your best life now. Why is that so counterintuitive? Because Jesus is about to require something from them. And so this is why I, re- this is why I point this out, because the reaction of the disciples, James and John in particular, right? Now, if you remember just a chapter ago, they they made their ascent to the um, transfiguration of Christ where the glory of God was just kind of going through his skin. And you got James and John there. You also have Peter there, which is quite interesting. And so James and John, they, they get to... They, they hear this from Jesus, and, and they go, you know what? I need my best life now. Can you tell me where my, in, in fact, don't even tell me where my seat is at the kingdom and the wedding feast. I want to be on your left, and I want him to be on your right hand. And, and you got you to think, maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe. Maybe they think that, that they've just gotten so tight with Jesus because, you know what, I saw, his, I saw him uh, transfigure into this glorious being. And so maybe they had this little, I don't know, like they just felt like, you know, me and Jesus are like this now. I, I got a little swag in me. I'm going to go ahead and make the ask. Hey, Jesus, I mean, I know you're about to die. You know, it sucks for you. Can I sit on your left and your right hand? They're, they're not concerned with what true following Christ means, but what their concern is, is status. Their concern is, what can you, Christ, do for me? And if that is our approach to Christianity... And if that is our approach to following Christ, you have missed it. If your approach to Christianity is, what can Jesus give me? You are not following the true Christ. You know, and it goes on too, right? I mean, it just doesn't stop with these guys. They just don't get it. And I'm thinking of after Jesus was resurrected and, and right before he ascends, if you, if you read like through Acts chapter 1, these same disciples, they come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Is, are you now about to restore the kingdom? Right? Are you now about to overthrow the government? Like now's the time, boy. Let's go get our Glocks and our AR-15s. It's time. Like that's exactly what they're thinking. And Jesus is like, what are you? No. My kingdom rule transcends all kingdoms on this earth. Why are you more concerned with status? Jesus is talking about suffering. They're talking about 
status, and perhaps they thought that they had become so deserving of such an experience that they deserve to be in the kingdom of God. And when God draws us and when he introduces us into his wonderful love, listen to me very carefully. It is not because you think that you deserve the spot in the kingdom. It is only because of his grace and his divine mercy that you will have a seat into the kingdom. It's just so interesting. They just don't get it. But the far more interesting question is, do you? Because that's the question that's being presented to us. They don't get it. Do you? That you think that you deserve a seat at the kingdom because of something you've done. Well, because I did this. Well, because I was a good person. Well, because I I built a a great and fabulous career. Well, because, you know, I raised children and never cursed at them one time. You a lie. Because I did all this. Because me, when you're building your salvation off of something that you think you've achieved, you've missed it. They just don't get it. And the question is, do you get it? That our salvation is not dependent on you. It was dependent upon the suffering of of Christ and what he had to endure that brought forth our redemption. They just don't get it. And there's a, and I, I can't help but to think that there must have been some sort of, I don't know, sadness in Jesus's response to him. And look at, look at back. I'm thinking of verse 39. He says to them, well, actually, you know, you will drink the cup. I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. It sounds like, what is he doing? Is he changing his tune here? Like, Jesus, are you having to change your heart? Is, are you just being so annoyed that you're like, you know, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I want you to suffer and endure the wrath of God. Because it seems like that would be an appropriate response. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, listen to me very carefully. You want to follow me that yes, you will suffer. Yes, you will experience death. But whatever you suffer, whatever pain in life you go through, that does not mean you get a more significant seat in the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean that just because this person goes through more suffering than this person, then this person deserves a better seat at the kingdom of God. No, that's not, a, not at all. In fact, Jesus is like, listen, I'm not even in charge of getting the seat assignments for the kingdom. That's the father. God's doing the, the father is, he's the one that's the sign, uh, the guy who is assigning all the seats. And now look what happens right here. (laughs) The other 10 disciples, you know, it says, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. I mean, that's an understatement, right? I mean, especially if you are Peter. I mean, because remember, Peter was with James and John at the transfiguration of Jesus. And so you got to be thinking, doing the calculation in your head if you're Peter. And you just heard James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder say, I'll take the right, you take the left. And Peter's like, wait a minute, what about me? I was the one who was also there with you. And they become enraged and they are angry. Remember, this is the constant tension that the disciples constantly had. It was right after the transfiguration of Jesus that they asked this similar question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Who's the best? Who's the one that gets to sit right right beside Jesus? I mean, at this point, it just sounds like a bunch of little children. Children in an elementary school, particularly in kindergarten or first grade. Well, I want to be the one who's the lead in the line. Now I'm going to be the line leader. Well, Miss, Miss Smith told me I can be the line leader. Why can't I be the line leader? And it's just like, what are you? 
They don't get it. Do you get it? Well, I want to be great in the kingdom. I want to do this. I want Jesus to look at me and be like, not just well done, not good and face service, but good Lord, we did a good job with you. You know, I don't know, the Holy Spirit, if that was on you, man, he, he, he just start applauding. That's what I want. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's convicting. Because we all want this Christianity. We all want this experience that serves us, that gives us what we want. And we all want this Jesus that makes us healthy, that makes us wealthy, that makes us wise. And and I think about what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And I think of the word of God that says, better to pluck out your eye and go into heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two. And I'm wondering who is the one saying that? Jesus is. Jesus is trying to divert our attention away from what we think success is and what we think greatness is. And Jesus is flipping that upside down and he's turning the tables once again. And he gives them this little explanation here uh, in verse 42. Let me, let me just, let me con- he says, let me contrast what, what you know of the Gentile rulers and what I want to be exemplified in those who are my followers. Now, the overreaching of the Gentile ruler is set in stark contrast against the characteristics of the kingdom of God. Because if anyone would just pull out a coin out of the purse or out of the pocket, You have the face of the emperor and inscribed right there on the, with the face of the emperor, it says he who deserves adoration. You know, maybe perhaps Jesus is saying, listen, this is the way of the Gentiles. They ascribe greatness to the emperor so that anytime somebody pull out that coin out their pocket or out their purse and they see the face and they say that these words, he who deserves adoration, they think this is what greatness looks like. This is the epitome of success. This is the epitome of how I want to be known in my life. I want others to look at me and have it transcribed over my head. That's the one who deserves adoration. Jesus draws his boys to a little schooling lesson here. And he flips things upside down from the, from the ways of the world. And Jesus understands as he surely has this in his mind, that, 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 that there is only one to be adored, and it is not the emperor. And you jokers are out here chasing after position, and you are chasing after the way of the Gentiles that says that greatness is the way of the emperor, the way of political gain, the way of political success, the way of financial success. And you look at this, and you see on the surface, he looks like he's got it all together. Jesus flips the world upside down and says, but I'm going to show you the true way of the kingdom. He gives just a couple of examples here. He gives these examples here of becoming a servant and a slave. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Probably the first time that this is introduced. Servantship, greatness, and servant. Same sentence. You want to be great? Serve. And then, and then in the Greek, this word right here is, is a little bit more heavy. It's you, you have to become a slave. So, so he's contrasting what Gentiles view as success with how the kingdom of God is viewing You, you want to be great? You want to sit beside me? Which I, I don't care where you, you know, that's not for me to determine. But if you, you want all of these, these achievements, then you're going to have to become like the slave. Man, you got to, like, like these disciples, like, wait, wait, wait. 
Jesus, I think you've been talking about death way too much, right? You got to think that this is probably their, their, their thinking that's happening right now. Like, Jesus, can I go get you a coffee or a tea? Because I just think that you just got too much heaviness on your mind right now. Things aren't really looking good for you. But Jesus is like, I want to I show you the kingdom of God. I want to show you what it looks like. That if you want this, you have to become a slave. Isn't that difficult for us today? Like even the concept of slavery, that's, that's really difficult for us to think about. And if I could just help us through that, that means, again, you've got to think of yourself as an insignificant person. And you've got, to, you've got to view yourself as little. Because that's been the theme throughout this whole chapter. If you want the kingdom of God, you've got to become little and insignificant. If you want greatness, you've got to become little and insignificant. And I got to be honest with you, that's very difficult to achieve, especially in the United States of America, where we want to achieve and where achievement is looked at as success because it's the American way. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he's like, you know, you worried about where you're sitting up in the, up in the kingdom. And I, I want to tell you that if you really want to be great, you, you've got to view yourself as little and insignificant. Another, another thought to this is that this idea of Christianity, that if it is not Jesus provides me something, i.e. health, wealth, happiness, then what does that mean? What does it look like? What is Jesus trying to drive into his disciples? You know, I just got to pause for a second. Like, like when you read this passage, you're thinking, wait a minute. The church... And the foundation of the church is resting on these buffoons. The church is resting on these 12, well, 11 jokers. By way, I would respond and say, how encouraging is that? That these idiots, all right? All right, you may think that's too strong. But that, that's just what they're displaying right now. A level, a level of incompetence. And yet, the foundation of the church is going to rest on these guys. And so Jesus looks at them and he's identifying something within them. He's trying to pull out of them. Listen, following me is going to cost you something. Right? And, and again, I press... No matter how you suffer, that doesn't mean you gain more merits in the kingdom. But following Christ is going to cost you something. It may cost a relationship, and I'm not talking about your spouse. Following Christ may cost you a relationship. Following Christ may cost you a career. Following Christ may cost you friendships. Following Christ may cost you something. You cannot enter into the relationship with Christ with the assumption that now that I'm saved, life is going to be so grandor and, and glamorous and, and everything's going to go my way. And he's going to give me the health, wealth, and prosperity. That's not what following Christ is. Following Christ is going to cost a something. This is an encouragement to us, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done here. I think I'm kind of a little over the place with my notes here. This is an encouragement because when you read through the Bible, one of the ways in which, one of the lenses that, that I read through it is that, I, is, is that I see that this is a book that's about God but it's also a book that this God who's been revealed to us through these scriptures has a plan of redemption. And if I look at these disciples and I think about how just dumb they can be and how they just don't get it, I find immense encouragement in that. Because Jesus picks these jokers and, and, and they just don't get it half of the time. And despite who they are, and despite their incompetence, God redeems them. 
And God uses them in a mighty way. And you better believe they were going to suffer. You better believe they were going to pay a price because the cost of following Christ is going to cost you something. There is a price to pay. This is why I kind of have a little issue with, with I, I don't want to speak over us, but maybe this, this idea of easy beliefism. Well, you just got to, you know, say this little prayer and da-da-da-da-da-da. You, you get a car, you get a car, you get a life, you get a life, you get a... Ooh. We just, you know, we just say, sign me up. You know, I want a good life. I want a happy life. Remember Jesus in the, in, in last week, you, you can't, you can't forget about these things. Jesus looks at their young, young uh, ruler and says, it's going to be difficult. Unless those who are willing to lay their life down for Christ, unless those who are willing to become little, unless those who are willing to become insignificant, theirs is the kingdom. Theirs is the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to them. And I know this sounds like, just like, a, like I'm beating a dead horse or just like I'm sounding like a broken record, like can't we get off this topic already? Maybe we're here for a reason. Maybe there's some of you that need to lay down the idols of success and achievement and greatness. And I got to tell you, and just be honest, hello, my name is Matthew Thor, and I got problems that this is also me. I mean, I don't want mediocre. I don't want people look at me like, oh, Matthew, he's a mediocre guy. No, we all chase after this. I want people to view me as like, look, that guy, that cat knew what he was talking about. He knows his stuff. And there's a little bit in, inside of my, I don't, okay, I just lied. There's a lot of that inside my life. And so this ain't for you. This message is for me. And Jesus would look at all of us. And he would tell us, like, if you want this kingdom message, you've got to understand that this is not about you. There's only one actor that this is about. There's only one person that the whole central Bible is about. And his name is Jesus Christ. And until we don't get that, then we will, we will be like these disciples, wondering, well, where am I going to sit in the kingdom of heaven? And, it, and it's so fascinating. And I told you I was done. I'm almost done. That was a lie. This is so fascinating about seating arrangements in heaven. We all worry, well, what if I don't get, what if I get, you know, aisle 730? You know, what if I get to the 7,435th? row. It doesn't matter because it's not about you. You will feel fulfilled wherever you are. But here's the even more spectacular thing about this. Where is Christ seated right now? Anybody? The right hand of the Father. In Colossians, it tells us that we are in Christ if you are in Christ, where are you seated? At the right hand of the Father. So where does it matter? Why then are you trying to achieve to get to the next level of greatness in the kingdom? When my life is secure and hidden in Christ, and that I am in him, that I am seated with him. So what does all this matter anyway? If at the moment that he eternally secures me in him, that I am in Christ, and Christ is at the right hand of the Father, that I am seated where he is. That is the beautiful message of the gospel. Now let's pray, Father, we thank you, Lord.